Greetings, friends of liberty. I must relate that I once had a passing acquaintanceship with the most interesting woman of color, or half-color, in the person of Jane Thresher, nay, Harry, born in Jamaica and brought to England with her father, Thomas Hibbert. She grew up under a guardian, who banished her from his care when she became a Quaker. Then, taken in by her Quaker mentor, Miss Mary Knowles, she lived in London and, on the death of her father, inheriting his estate, determined to free his slaves, but died before she could accomplish her intention. Really a most extraordinary woman of compassion, intellect, and initiative. However, when we turn to your 21st century, we find that, quite coincidentally, the Germanic equivalent of Thresher, Jane's last name, in our author today, the noted historian Seymour Thresher, who has written From Slavery to Freedom, Comparative Studies in the Rise and the Fall of Atlantic Slavery, and The Connicide, British Slavery in the Era of Abolition. In 2003, he also won the Frederick Douglass Book Prize of $25,000 for The Mighty Experiment, Free Labor versus Slavery in British Emancipation. In this book, Abolition, A History of Slavery and Anti-Slavery, Dresher describes in intimate detail the events that culminated in the destruction of the slave trade and, with it, the eventual extinction of chattel slavery itself in most of the civilized world. He begins with numerous excerpts, showing how very accepted the practice of slavery was regarded as a traditional and sometimes even moral institution throughout most of the world, even in the 1840s. In the first excerpt, we see the British head of an abolitionist society presenting himself to a Moroccan governor <clears throat> in the hope that he will accept a petition to free the slaves in his province. The governor, however, refuses noting how the Quran sanctions slavery, how his subjects would quickly rebel if he attempted an abolitionist decree, and how the sultan in Constantinople would likely separate his head from his body forthwith. Such was the state of affairs regarding manumission in Muslim North Africa. Similarly, in the United States, a congressional gag rule was enacted that prevented even any mention of the subject of abolition. And finally, not 12 years earlier, the Iron Duke Lord Wellington, as Prime Minister, thought that we shall never succeed in abolishing excuse me, the foreign slave trade. How then did such a momentous change in the human condition occur with such an enormous increase in human happiness? And in a world where, in 1772, the best estimate was that of the Earth's 775 million inhabitants, all but 33 million could be classified as unfree. It began with one country, my country, arguably the most civilized in the world. From this country came a love of freedom, which, although always present, was now spurred to even greater heights by the age of reason and the philosophy of the Enlightenment. But before we recount the start of the English abolitionist movement, let us briefly set the international stage by describing slavery and the state of the slave trade as it had been practiced up to that time. Generally speaking, slaving had been done by capturing people of other religions. <clears throat> so, while even into the 1600s, Muslims were still sometimes enslaving Muslims and Christians Christians from faraway regions such as Greece and Eastern Europe, the main slave trade was still along religious lines with Muslims enslaving Christians and Christians Muslims. This also meant, as Drescher says, there were far more British slaves in North Africa until the 1640s than there were Africans in the British colonies. These European slaves consisted of Icelanders, Irish, Irish Scottish, Welsh, English, French, German, and Scandinavian captives, flowing from Western Europe, joined by Greeks, Albanians, Armenians, Hungarians, Poles, and Russians. 
In addition, the trade from Sub-Saharan Africa into the Middle East totaled 6,000 persons per year, and during war, captives in the tens of thousands would be captured during campaigns and sold at slave auctions. To the victors went the human spoils. But what occurred as Europe slowly passed out of the Middle Ages and into modernity? First, in contrast to Muslim-controlled areas, Christian areas would, apart from the, as previously mentioned, use of Christian heretics or Eastern Orthodox as galley slaves, increasingly not enslave either Christians or even Muslims in Europe proper. By 1596, for example, the Netherlands had simply unilaterally freed 130 captives brought into the Middleburg Harbor, and the French had done likewise to captives brought into the harbor of Bordeaux in 1572. Secondly, as Europe became much more civilizationally superior than Africa and the Middle East, with this increased productivity and their more capable seafaring and maritime transportation, came the ability to transport slaves from Africa to newly discovered areas in the New World. In other words, the Atlantic slave trade. And given that American Indian populations had been reduced by disease and were often too recalcitrant and fractious to be suitable as slaves, and given that enslaving Europeans was distasteful, the clear alternative then for Europeans was to enslave Africans, especially given their traditional practice of capturing neighboring tribesmen and offering them for sale as slaves. In addition, using Africans for slaves in slave plantations in tropical climates was also consistent with the European belief, to a degree substantiated by the reduced susceptibility of blacks to malaria, that Africans were better suited to these conditions. Now, having set the stage, let's return to England and the beginnings of the abolitionist movement there, which roughly coincided with the famous decision in 1772 of my friend, Chief Justice Lord Mansfield in Somerset v. Stewart, which decision clarified English law that slaves couldn't be held in England. And at about the same time came the first wave of numerous petitions to Parliament, which hundreds of persons had signed expressing their overwhelming and unprecedented support for abolishing slavery. However, just at this time, the American Revolution also occurred, and so both England and America, whose citizens had previously had the energy to attack slavery, now turned their attention to different national and political priorities. In addition, in England, once the French Revolution and then the Napoleonic Wars started, they distracted us too, and on your side of the Atlantic, your desire to form a new country resulted in ignoring this issue since addressing it appeared to disturb national unity. However, on our side, the British public persisted with their petitions to Parliament from 1787 to 1807, submitting 12 in total, receiving for one petition 400,000 signatures among the most ever collected. As our Lord Castlereagh said, I believe that there is hardly a village that is not met and petition. Our English womanhood, with their natural compassion, played an ever larger role in collecting signatures, making speeches, and writing articles, with the result that by 1807 the slave trade was outlawed. And since England was, of course, then fighting the Napoleonic Wars, England started to put constant pressure on its allies, the Spanish and Portuguese, to attack the trade also. After the Napoleonic Wars, the continued cost to the British public added up. A. Of £40 million alone just for continuing to fund the Royal Navy in its pursuit of slavers and our blockade of various countries. B. Of the cost for bribing other countries to sign treaties. C. Of the funding for the refugee colony for freedmen in Sierra Leone. D of partly subsidizing our English colonial sugar planters paying compensation to foreign ship owners as well, 
And E, last but not least, 20 million pounds to slave owners, slave holders for their slaves. At the same time, once the decision to abolish slavery was made, it was also true that it then involved our own national well-being, since sugar plantations were very profitable. So if we were going to deprive ourselves of them, then why should others have them as well? As Drescher noted, in the Caribbean in 1770, the British and French share of exports was 89% and the Spanish 1%. But by 1850, so 80 years later, that had flipped with the British and French share reduced to 35%, but the Spanish increased to 57 Leveling the economic playing field among all players was thus a direct intention of British policy. By 1833, with another final petition of over 1.3 million signatures, Parliament finally took it upon itself to outlaw slavery in Britain and her western colonies, freeing 800,000 slaves. During the subsequent decades, the government, concentrating on shutting down the slave trade first, put sustained diplomatic and blockade pressure on the Portuguese and in Brazil in 1845 enacted the Aberdeen Act which allowed the direct confiscation of Brazilian vessels. Fortunately, by 1850, the Brazilian public itself had turned sympathetic and against the slave traders by forming their own native abolitionist society. The fight against slavery reached a turning point by 1865, when along with the defeat of the Confederacy, the Atlantic slave trade was finally ended as well. From that point on, both your government and mine pursued others around the world to finally end slavery itself. Number one, Spain eventually passed a free womb law, meaning that all newborns were free, which, in conjunction with geriatric freedom after age 65, put an expiration date on slavery there. In Puerto Rico, number two, partial compensation was given to slaveholders, ending slavery in 1873. Number three, in Cuba, a royal decree in 1886 brought slavery to an end. And with the passage of its Golden Law of 1888, number four, Brazil finally ended slavery in the New World. Subsequently, in the next decades, the British turned their attention to numerous Islamic countries, such as Turkey, Algeria, Egypt, and Ethiopia bringing abolition for most of the Middle East and Africa by the 1920s. Now, although Drescher emphasizes the extraordinary pioneering role that My England played in abolishing worldwide slavery, he also illuminates many other topics related to this long period. With paragraph after paragraph filled with unique observations and detail, constantly demonstrating his profound depth of knowledge. Amongst the points additionally discusses, number one, the apparent truth that of all the religionists, Protestants generally were the most enterprising in early abolitionism with Quakers, Methodists, and Baptists taking the lead. Then Catholics were much slower and finally Muslims the slowest. Partly, however, this slowness was correlated with Catholics and Muslims also tending to live in more tropical areas, which favored plantation slavery more. So it's unclear how much of a factor religion played and how much climate. Number two, slavery among the Europeans tended to last the longest in galley slaves, perhaps because this use in defense of the state was regarded as more justifiable. Number three, as is not at all surprising, our English colonies were much more peaceful in their transition to, to abolition than the French colonies were. So, for example, the most violent slave rebellion among our two nations took place in the French colony of Haiti, with approximately 170,000 dead. By contrast, in Jamaica, in the greatest insurrection in the English colonies, only 14 people were killed, and in what is today Guyana, only three. As Frederick Douglass said in 1848, we have discovered in the progress of the anti-slavery movement that England's passage to freedom is not through rivers of blood, 
what is bloody revolution in France is peaceful reformation in England. Number four, the world seemed to agree that the slave trade was bad and yet it united against that before it agreed that slavery was bad. Number five, the role of women in the Anglosphere in the abolitionist movement was substantial but virtually non-existent in Catholic or Muslim countries. Number six, the reemergence of 20th century slavery in the Soviet Union, Nazi Germany, and fascist Japan. In the Soviet Union, as would befit a communist nation, the person was owned by the state instead of the individual, and his status was not hereditary, but assigned due to violations of communist law or doctrine. In addition, Drescher points out that slavery increased tenfold during Stalin's reign of terror, that the Gulag Archipelago functioned to isolate slaves in the same way that Caribbean islands had in previous centuries, and that the number of people relocated by the Soviets matched the number of transatlantic forced migrants over a period ten times as long. In Nazi Germany, whose extensive slave laborers, numbering over 13 million in 1944, had been foreshadowed by the Kaiser's use of slave laborers in World War I. Drescher compares the re this regime in some ways to Roman slavery, with the state constantly capturing and utilizing more slaves as the size of its territory expanded. Drescher ends his book by observing that now, as opposed to over two centuries ago, when the movement to abolish slavery started, today less than 1% of the world is enslaved. In conclusion, I'd give this book an A for being both very readable and filled throughout with hundreds of insights of value to the student of slavery. On that note of historical admiration, I bid you well and remain the Scarlet Pimpernel.